Hi everyone and welcome to Vitality Speaker Series. I'm Adam Savile, Chief Editor for Vitality. And today we've got a really special session lined up here at Penny Hill Park. I'm going to be handing over in just a moment to Jamie Monk, Head of Health, Health and Wellbeing for Vitality, who's in conversation with Johnny Wilkinson, Vitality Ambassador and all-round rugby hero. And they'll be touching upon the topic of mental health during Mental Health Awareness Week. So, please sit back. We hope you enjoy the session. Over to you, Jamie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very special event with Vitality in alignment with Mental Health Awareness Week. As you can see, we are so privileged to be joined by Johnny Wilkinson today. Johnny, it's always a privilege to hmm. see you. We are so proud to have you as a Vitality Ambassador. Um, I'm actually going to start this off with uh, reading out your incredibly impressive nice. resume. Okay. Um, I'm sure, hopefully, you're not bored of this. Obviously, we all know you're famous to be, to be obviously, Rugby World Cup winner. World Rugby Player of the Year. Um, you've represented the British and Irish Lions, um, won numerous do domestic trophies. Um, I'm pretty sure the Vitality Ambassador role is right up there as well yeah. for you. Yes, um, but I think what sets you apart as well from those elite things that you've done is your openness and the way that you talk about your mental health and wellbeing. So that is just a list of achievements. So my first question really to you is, how would you like to introduce yourself? Um... I think the most important thing for me is just, it's kind of how I turn up. It's like in my energy, I guess. That's all I've got to really go with. That's all I've got is my example and kind of what I've done will be defined by how I turn up now, if you like, mm -hmm. and what I'm going to do in my life is all kind of part of that. So that's the only thing that's really precious to me right now is how do I turn up in this moment um, and to try and keep that energy in alignment with the kind of world I want to live in, mm. the kind of life I want to live and the kind of future I want to, to have for, you know, for those around me and for myself too. I think we've got a team at Vitality here with us today and we've all felt that energy actually and it's, it's a nice space <laughs> to be right now. Right. Um, and I think something that I wanted to touch on just to start with is you've been so generous, I think, to tell your story, to share the real depths of those insights. Um, both during your sporting career, but also the transition out of it. So would you mind kind of sharing your journey and your relationship with your mental health through the various stages of your career? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, mental health is already an interesting kind of term, one that it can be redefined as, as you wish, but ultimately, for me, it's just about what I was saying before about how you're turning up in this in this moment. And when you feel absent, distant, um, when you feel conflicted, stressed, struggling, or whatever, it's kind of on a spectrum of towards where you have joy and the ecstasy and, and everything that that comes with those incredible moments. And it's really just kind of a line that's constantly moving. Um, and my mental health or my health in general, my the way that I've been able to live my life has been always up and down that spectrum, especially when I was younger. I had an enormous amount of fear that played a part in my life to the extent that it was paralyzing. And it was a sense of doom that was way beyond the worst thing you could imagine because it didn't have a name, it didn't have a thing. It's not something you could put a face on. It was just this sense of absolute terror that was, that was underpinning, I guess, the way that I constructed myself to defend against it. So I, I went for, how could I save myself against this unknown doom as, as a child? So you come up with ideas like uh, perfectionism and then you, you grab onto values, you know. So what is it to be a good person? What is it to be right, to be successful? These are all things I have to do in order to keep this thing at bay. So I, I became, I guess, a, a result of those kind of ideas and conclusions that I made. At the same time, I had this incredible passion for playing sport, for mm. ball sports, you just couldn't stop me from doing it. So I had this two parts going on in my life, this huge fear and then this huge, enormous um, drive and, and desire to get out there and see what I was capable of. And those two things ultimately, would, I guess, define that, that experience on that spectrum the whole way through. At times I was caught more by the fear, at times I was following my passion. What I tended to find was when the whistle went in the game, I clicked into passion mode. Time flew. I was so present. I used to do things that 
I didn't know how I did them. Time was a sort of a really abstract concept for me during those moments because I'd be doing things and thinking, did I know I was going to do that? Mm. Did I know think that was just about to happen? How did I know that I, I can't work it out? How was I communicating with someone here? Crazy. And yet the experience in between those whistles, which unfortunately was most of the week, <laughs> was the opposite. Mm. You know, largely it was about uh, suffering, sacrificing, survival, mm. just protecting, controlling, constantly feeling threatened by this future, feeling threatened by the things I'd, m mistakes I'd made or whatever, or things that I thought I hadn't gone as well as I could, threatened by what might happen in the future and doing my best just to plan it all away, just so I didn't have to touch it. And yet in between those whistles, I explored in between those whistles my capacity to respond to anything. Fearlessly, fully engaged, but in the rest of my life I spent a large amount of time, not all of the time, I had you know, those amazing moments off the field as well, but I spent a huge amount of my time completely denying my ability to respond. Mm. Completely looking at myself as needing to know everything in advance so I could plan and, and achieve this perfection. Yet where I felt that greatest kind of buzz in my life was when I let go. So at some point during my career, I started to understand mainly through having all these injuries for four years and, and being completely worn out, broken down in so many ways, I suddenly realized if I look back over my career, I was like, okay, well, there's been some great moments, but have I lived it fully? And the answer was a resounding no. And I thought, well, geez, fast forward, this is me on my deathbed looking back at life going, I've not even touched it. Mm. I haven't done anything. I haven't moved. I haven't, I haven't done the important bit. I've... I've had some experiences and, and I've created some ideas and I've let those ideas live my life for me. I've never once looked and said, how do I want to live? How can I live? And taken on that huge mantle, which is part of creating the world that we have now. And at what point do you, you say, like, I'm old enough to start taking responsibility for myself rather than looking back and saying, well, this is how it was when I was young. This is how I was raised, how I was brought up. This is the idea. It's like, well, what about now? How do you want to live? And that became the the big push towards looking inwards and saying well hold on it's it's no longer going to be other people's fault how mm. i feel it's no longer going to be um you know okay to just get through this next moment i want to express my gift i want to connect to other people i want to find out what life's about i want to find out deeply deeply who i am and that's not a part-time vocation mm. it's not something you do when the weather's good yeah um it's something that every part of your life every moment of your life becomes a signpost towards something bigger and, and suddenly life changes completely i think it's so relevant as well to the conversations that people are having at the moment and i was um told you this enough time doing my research on this I'm very well prepared and i came across a quote from a podcast that someone said um relating to self-confidence and they said Something like self-confidence isn't about looking in the mirror and shouting affirmations at yourself. It's about creating an undeniable stack of evidence to prove that you are the person that you say you are. Outwork your self-doubt. Now, that to me seemed like a perfect reflection of potentially what your rugby career was like. But with mental health, we feel like potentially it's a stage where we're moving on to mental health part two. And that way of thinking is maybe more detrimental pe to people than good. Firstly, would you say that is a fair reflection on maybe how you felt playing? And secondly, how do you look on that approach now? I think we're always doing the best we can. And we're always desperate. I think, I think innately in people, there's no doubt in my mind that we're always trying to help each other. We're always trying to do our best. We're always trying to make the most. We're all trying to find happiness. But we're doing it through old ideas, which have limits and certain kind of patterns to them and until we break out of those old ideas whatever we try and do within them is going to reinforce them mm -hmm. and so everything we do to find happiness is finding more yeah. disappointment everything we try, try to do to find freedom is finding more enslavement mm -hmm. and everything we try to do to find that inner wow is finding us feeling more victimized by the world and i think the the big part there is is it's ultimately you said the movement and the mental health thing is that there is so much good stuff out there 
but unless we have the willingness to really mean it mm -hmm. and to go into spaces where it's uncomfortable and ultimately let go of this idea of who you, the idea of who you think you are and let go of the idea of who you think you should be and start giving over some of that to finding out all you are meant to be, yeah. who you're supposed to be. And when we take control of who we think we're supposed to be, you're going to get nowhere near. Yeah. You'll just be, you'll, you'll be an old version of who you were when you were younger, mm -hmm. older, less physically able, yeah. less sharp. And it's like, it's describing I mean, me. well, this is it. <laughs> the point is that when you live through that old idea of yourself, very physical idea, then that phrase, life say, and then you die, mm. it's like, well, that's pretty true. Mm. But when you live, when you explore what's beyond that physical idea of this is just me, no, no, this is not me. Find out who you are more, that's not how life is. And that's, that's the big challenge, I think, is that yeah, the, the, the mental health movement about those things is great, but there's the next step. Yeah. The next step is this can't be something that happens to you. It's mm. something you have to you have to do the letting go. You can't get the world to let go for you. Mm. And um, what it doesn't mean when you let go is that you give up. Yeah, your gift, your desires, your your purpose, your meaning, all those things. For me, anyway, as I've gotten out the way of them, have come through stronger. I don't have a life of oh well because I've given up. It's like oh well, I'm nothing. I just get blown around by the wind. It's like yeah. I know now more what I'm supposed to be doing here than I ever have because I've gotten out the way. It's getting in the way of your gift that that I think kind of creates that much dimmer light of presence that maybe you feel. But when people are out the way of it, you know this, when people feel phenomenal, they feel free, they shine bright. Mm. Just their presence in a room can blow mm. you away. But we're too busy on looking at how we look, which is just getting in the way of that light. Yeah. The light that, we're, that is so desperate to come out of us. It, it, I think when you... Because it, it probably takes a little bit of inner work to figure it out a little bit, to, to really appreciate what you're saying and really feel it. And listening to you and being with you, you've, I feel it rather than, not, it's not even what you're saying necessarily, it's kind of that energy like you were saying. And something that I've heard you speak about in terms of sort of your journey with mental health. And again, we want to make this as relevant to as many people as possible, whether they're employees, employers, advisors, mm. brokers, you know, there's people are people at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to talk more, we're trying to share a positive message, and we're also just trying to help people with their health. And something that I've heard you talk about that is the non-negotiable for your health is about awareness, acceptance, and responsibility. Would you mind sharing with us kind of what those three things mean to you? Um, yeah, nothing can, can happen to anything unless you become aware of it in the first place. So, you know, people want to change the way they are or the things that they don't like, but you have to become aware of those first. The awareness is, is the biggest part of everything. Um, that's what I was mentioning before about this idea that becoming aware of the capacity you have on the inside to create an environment that which completely changes the world. Without that awareness, what do you do? Mm. And it's not, oh, you, well, you're not doing awareness. It's just people are always operating to the limits of their awareness. If you want to operate high, you have to increase your awareness, which is that ability to, to observe what's going on, not analyze. Mm -hmm. Awareness and analysis or evaluation are not the same thing. This was a big thing that I would do. I'd say, well, I'm being aware whilst criticizing myself. It's like, no, it's not the same thing. Awareness yeah. is neutral. It's, it's, it's compassionate, it's, it's loving and it's welcoming, but it's, it's neutral. It doesn't have an opinion on what you're doing. Mm. Otherwise, it's part of what you're doing. It's that deep awareness and finding that is huge, but you have to have a reason for it. There has to be a reason. Why is it important enough for you to turn away from the obvious, which is like, oh, well, my happiness will come from the situation around me. To turn away from that, you have to have a reason. And my reason, like I said, in the middle of my career was that I've achieved everything I could ever want. It made no difference. Yes, I enjoyed it for hugely. And there's that extent. I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that on the way there, it's a beautiful experience. And getting it for a, for a moment was like pure bliss. But then afterwards you're like, well, what was that about? It was mm. a con. So my awareness was like, well, hold on, it's not there. And then my looking at how I was living my life was still built upon this idea that it wasn't there then, but it will be 
in a minute yeah. when I get that. Yeah. It's at what point do you stop and realize that this life has to be lived fully? And that wasn't living fully. The acceptance is that when you're aware of something, like I said about that, that neutral, compassionate, loving side is this, to be fully accepting of it. And that full acceptance leads to choice, leads to you getting back your, um, your, your presence, getting back your, the, the control of all your faculties. In resistance, it's just reactivity. Mm. So whenever you resist something, all you do is trigger reactivity, which triggers old things you've put in place in the past. Your resistance will live your entire life for you. And the thing is, you already know what it's going to do for you because mm. it's doing it now. This is it. Just fast forward 50 odd years, a few ups, a few downs, but this will be it. Yeah. But acceptance just removes that almost... Um, it removes that guarantee of more of what we've had before and it stops everything dead and returns you to the unknown. Because in pure acceptance of a, of, a, of a moment, of this moment now, in pure acceptance of it, there's nothing to be, nowhere to go, nothing to do. It's stunning. Your whole world stops and suddenly, you, like I said, you get full sort of charge of your faculties back. And the final part, responsibility, is then, well... What are you going to do with those faculties? Mm -hmm. And that means tuning into what's exciting to you. Where's your passion? Where's your calling? Where's your urge? And to become more and more with awareness and acceptance, more subtly connected to those moments where life is calling you in every moment to go here, to go there. This person's come into your life. Why? What are you going to find out? And then suddenly every moment is like, is the World Cup final whistle? You're thinking, what's here? The same way I was when the ball was leaving the field and I saw the ref go to his pocket for his whistle. It's like, what's coming? But now you live your life in that space. Yeah. Or you can live it in a dulled out, numbed space where you're waiting for some magical thing to happen long in the future. Yeah. Or you can find your now where it is, here and now. And there's so much that's fascinating in there. Um, just wanting to, I think the awareness part is is really important. But something that you mentioned about the acceptance that I've heard said before, and might have even been, I'm going to give you credit for it. Yeah, was, I'll have, I'll have uh, it. Yeah, it was it definitely yours. Well, you haven't heard it yet. Uh, pain, <laughs> it was mine, whatever it is. <laughs> pain times resistance equals suffering. Okay. And, and that kind of, like you say, it's, it's about letting it happen. But just I wanted to go to the awareness point because that seems to be the place that it starts. And um, something that I once remember Kobe Bryant, who's like one of my favorite mm. athletes, talk about. Wow, he, said, yeah. he said, if you knew what it took, for me to get here and to be me, no one would swap, you know? You look at part of my life and you want that part, but to get that part, you have to have all of the other parts. And those parts are rooted in struggle and probably a dark place. So you mentioned that with awareness, there has to be a purpose, but there has to be a thing maybe that happens that allows you to find it. Again, though, for our people watching, have you got any advice to help them find it? Yeah, I, th I think it's whatever's causing you the most suffering right now. And then to ask, come away from, from what, it, what the, the external situation is as best you can and say, well, hold on, um, what if I had a different way of looking at this? What if I didn't see life the way it is? What if I had a different view of myself? And a lot of it, as you mentioned about the responsibilities, what if I a good question would be, what if this was part of the path and not a wrong turn? Mm. And now suddenly you realize that it is always part of the path because it's here now. But when you keep turning away from those difficult moments, at the end of your life, you'll be more or less where you started. Or you can keep pushing on beyond. But the, the way to find the energy to push on beyond for me has always been, like you said, with that first part of the awareness, is just seeing how your life's been lived for you. Mm -hmm. What you feel about a situation, what you feel about yourself, whatever, it comes up. It's lived for you. But it comes up because there's almost, the way I sometimes sort of look at it is almost kind of like the past you as you're about to step into your world and the world is there to hit you in this beauty of this present moment. But just before you get there, the past you gets there and just molds it into what it's been used to and just says, now have that instead. Mm. 
And at what point do you sort of say, the past me is no longer going to live my now. Tell me what's okay in the now. I'm going to explore that for myself. But in order to become aware that that's what's happening. That's what resistance and reactivity is. Um, and for me, it was always that, that question, you know, what I'm feeling now, what I'm telling myself, is it really true? Really true? Mm. And not to try and answer that question because the past you will go, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. But to ask you it and then relax. And awareness is, as has been explained before, awareness is uh, or can be seen as almost the relaxation of focus. So you have like your awareness and your attention very focused. And when you relax, it expands. For awareness to expand, you have to relax. Mm. And you look at how much are you relaxing in your life? How much do you deeply relax? How much are you consciously able to say, yes, I have these feelings coming up because this person's in the room or because this has happened, but yes, I can still relax. That probably is the best space I could say for me is that in order to increase awareness, what I do is I, find, I challenge myself to be like, okay, is it true that it's completely unsafe right now? And often the answer is no, it's mm. not true at all. And I say, well, I'm going to relax then. Yeah. And as you relax, you get back your choice, you become more aware of actually what's happening in me. And that very question is, is it true that I can't be how I want to be right now? Is it absolutely true? Yeah. Now, it's very rare that there's some kind of physically sort of dangerous survival situation. But when there is, of course, you know, you won't even ask that question. You'll yeah. be busy doing it. But <laughs> yeah. often it's a case of saying, well, hold on can I relax in this moment? When I do, it's like, well, then I'll start to be aware of it. Mm. And when I have that space, I'll start to be able to choose whether I can accept it or not. The answer to that is yes, acceptance is unbeatable. You can always accept that you can't accept. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't beat acceptance and then you're on, the, you're on the road. I think you brought it to life, actually, everything that you just said there before we started filming, where you said to me, it can't be wrong. And I was like, okay, that's, that's really helpful, actually. That's really nice to know. Um, we're, I think we're, we're kind of maybe in a place here where we're, to start discussing it another way with mental health and something that we're very keen to support people with is the interrelationship between all of the pillars of your health so the connection between your physical your mental maybe there's social maybe there's nutritional financial and the roles that each of these play in our overall well-being in your experience and in your view how closely connected do you think each of the pillars are and how do you know what you need at what moments they're all, for me, absolutely connected. They're all absolutely um, one, but just different routes in. And it's, and it's important, I think, to explore all of them, hugely. The, the, the physical body, it's, it's crazy how small changes can really change the way the world looks. Mm. But that old you will say, that no, way. Yeah. But it requires that capacity to, to relax into it, try things, give it time, have patience and, and what have you. Um, I think the everything from the social side, the, probably the way that I know what I want is, or I look at how I want is, is I've started to become quite precious with my health in general. And I'm not going to waste any of that energy. Um, what I'm going to do is in, in, always having these two choices you either f you have this amazing opportunity to feel very good or you have this opportunity to look at things differently and feel sort of conflict and in, in conflict and resistance to it but with that choice every thought everything you kind of eat everything you do with your body is on is up for grabs mm -hmm. and the question is you know does this does thinking this is it moving me into more is it spinning that wheel of feeling amazing or is it spinning right. the wheel of feeling rubbish? Yeah. And quite often you could say, well, I'm not feeling, it doesn't make me feel good. Well, then let it go. Mm. But you think, no, but there's truth, so I need to. But it's not, there is no truth. The truth it belongs to those two opportunities. When you're in this one, everything looks great. When you're in this one, everything looks terrible. Yeah. But you have the opportunity to feed one or the other. Mm. But as you feed the one that looks terrible, you then start to feed it more because it feels true. So you then go again, right. but so does feeling awesome. All it takes is to have that ability to say, is this making me feel good? No, well, I'm not going to do it. Is this making me, it is, I'm going to do it some more. Yeah. What I'm eating. And it's, it's difficult because sometimes you, you, when you feel sort of 
more rubbish, you go to those choices of what you're eating, yeah. what you're thinking, who you're hanging out with. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, it is making me feel good, but it's different, it's a relief. Yeah. Relief versus feeling good is very different. When you have that relief, it's survival. <gasps> this is the end of my survival for a bit. Mm -hmm. It's different to, this feels good. Very different things. I lived a lot of my career in that space where the game would become just, I've got to get through this. I've got to keep my reputation alive. I've got to, um, you know, I've not got to humiliate myself. I've got to um, try and people still love me, all this stuff. I've got to do this for me. I've got to be right. I've got to be perfect and everything. At the end of it, it was just, oh, thank God. Mm. Now I started to get a buzz from the feeling of, oh, thank God. Yeah, I started to think that was feeling good. Right. It was, but then I was looking, you know, I didn't know the capacity to be out there and to recognizing that difference between feel good and relief and then saying, is this thought relieving me at best or is this one feeling my good? And when I'm thinking about things that make me feel good, it's about stuff that's passions. Yeah. I want to go and do this. Wouldn't it be amazing if this happened? Yeah. Mm. So then you're into the law of attraction, dreaming, creating the world, just because you think, is this helping me feel good? You know, when I get a bit more sleep, does that make me feel good? Yeah, it does. Mm. I'm not saying sleep all your day away, but I mean, <laughs> well, recognize that that's more important than when it doesn't. Yeah, but when I stay up late at night and watch a few more box sets, yeah, but is that really making you feel good or yeah. is this relief? That's amazing. Something I um, was thinking about there was that I once heard that every action that you take is a vote for the person that you want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And it helped me a bit when um, sort of through university years and things like that and sport and my health was most important. Um, and you get pressured to to tick another box, you know, drink or stay yeah. out late and all those things. And for me, what helped me in that moment was, well, that's not a vote for the person that I want to be. And then um, I wanted my intention to align with who I was. Mm. And something that I've heard you say is that, um, another Johnny quote, uh, working on yourself tends to work for everyone. Um, with that in mind, what's your advice to people again, that when you've got, the other box is popular or normal or the way that society suggests you should be. How do you still take the vote for the person that you truly want to be? Um, I think it's a courageous thing to mm -hmm. do. I think, um, but also it's, again, it's really key that, that the awareness of it is that this is really what you want to be. Um, and not, this is what I think I should be, which is almost like another version of the peer pressure, mm. you know, saying, well, hold on, I should be really, I should be living my best life. It's like, no, no, find out what person do you really want to be, having that ideal version of you, but being honest with it. Like I said, I, I, when I was younger, what drove me was this idea about me being the one lifting the trophy. That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's why it worked mm -hmm. up until a point where me being that person in my head, didn't work anymore, but I didn't change. I didn't start voting, for, I still voted for that person. Yeah. You've got to be subtle along the way to adapt and be able to say, now what I've found is that I have a real sort of strong idea of who I wanna be in some areas, but so much of it I leave open. What I tend to sort of go with now is not, I wanna be the person that lists this trophy, but I don't wanna be responsible for, the, for success. I actually wanna be someone that relaxes, moves, connects with people, sort of flows, barely touches the floor when they walk. Mm. Yeah, I want to be someone that breathes deep. I want to be someone that looks around and just can't, that there's nothing better than this moment. But sometimes when you can have a very strong idea, you say, be careful that that doesn't then become another pressure in your life that you need to be. But you mentioned it before, one thing that uh, works for me with the voting for who you want to be is that I sometimes feel like with acceptance, awareness and responsibility, I look and think, well, hold on, the choice I take now is going to be a gift to the future me. Yeah. So I think, well, if I accept this and I'm, if I'm aware of it and I accept it, and then I open up my opportunities to deciding who and how I want to respond next. And I offer that to the future me and make it even more of a possibility for the future me, that future me is going to look back and be like, nice one. Mm -hmm. But if I go react, respond, get through it, relieve, and I hand that over, he's, he's going to go, yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> Stitch me. Thanks. <laughs> Good one. Because that's what habits do. Mm. You know, and as you give that habit, the future you becomes more inclined to feel that rush. Yeah. But when you do your work now, it works for everyone, including the future you. Yeah. But it works for everyone else just because everyone's after that. And, and when 
no matter what you're doing, when your behavior sort of goes right, and, and this is not to, to um, oversimplify or not pay absolute respect to what people are going through, and who knows the challenges people are coming up with far exceed anything I could even imagine right now. It's not, that's not what I'm commenting on, but whatever is within your capacity to say, right, my next behavior, I might be helping so many people, but if I'm stressing and suffering the hell out of myself in helping them, I'm adding to the sum total of suffering in the universe. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've got to find a way of being like, yes, I am helping people, but I also, before that, I'm helping myself so that whatever I'm doing, I'm bringing down the level of suffering. I'm bringing down the level of stress. I'm bringing down the level of conflict because yeah. inner conflict is still conflict. Mm -hmm. Whatever we're doing, we're chucking it up there and going, right, and that's the gift to everyone. we are saying, a bit like COVID, you know, there was an anxiety in the air mm -hmm. that was palpable. It, it got into my being and it came out of me in all funny ways because people couldn't help it. It was an anxious time. And of mm. course, people suffer horribly and it's, and it's been tough for so many people, but you could feel it. You could feel it because everyone was adding to it. Yeah. But that's our gift as a collective is to, you know, as one being is to, we're all part of that being in some way and to do our, our bit, I think, it, yeah, makes it easier for others as well as our future selves to do their bit as well. When they look and say, I've had captains in, in teams I play for, I look and say, geez, you haven't been picked for this game, but look at you. Mm. You're still chilling out and you're still having fun. I'm like, it's possible. It's yeah. possible. Yeah. Suddenly my heart goes, well, if that ever happens to me, you've just given me a gift. Mm. Or you can give the gift of, oh my God, life's terrible. Yeah. Look how hard it is. And this didn't go well. And no, look what's happening. Yeah. You're looking at that going, right? Okay. <laughs> a different different yeah. way of looking at it. I think, I think that's such a really valid point that, you know, example here, every single person in this room is contributing to this conversation, mm, the yeah. interactions that we've had. And that kind of, that's quite a nice segue, I think. I didn't, well, that, not sure well if it's intentional, well but, uh, you know, we've got some research at my time to do Britain's Healthiest Workplace, and that research shows that one in five people are showing signs of burnout. And I think something that I wanted to bring to you is maybe your lessons from sport and culture and teams and things like that. Um, and I remember you talking about in an interview once that when you were injured, whoever came in to replace you seemed to get man of the match. Like they just seemed to be the best player on the pitch all of a sudden. And no doubt, if it was me anyway, there'd be a part of me thinking, ah, this is terrible news. Like, I want them to have the worst game ever. Mm, yeah. um, but there's a South African philosophy that uh, I like a lot and resonate with a lot called Ubuntu. Have you heard of that? I think it was um, Doc Rivers, who was the yeah. coach of the Celtics, that I kind of, I know you're a basketball fan, he kind of um, brought it to life for me. And it kind of stands for, I am because we are. So I need you to be at my best so that yeah. I can be at mine. And I think that's maybe what I equated the man of the match thing to with you is that you'd set that standard, you'd set that tone so other people were coming in and just matching that. So thinking about workplaces and cultural environments from your sporting experiences, how would you create that environment where everyone is supporting each other? It's, yeah, it's a big question um, because that's a global question mm. we have as a global population, but it's also all in the mini communities and the families and, and whatever you're doing and within yourself even. Um, but I think the f first thing that always fascinates me is the number of times that people within a team that I played in, coaches or me as a captain or whatever, would go, I just want to get the best out of my team. But the hardest part about that is it being, when you get pulled up on it, you say, well, do you know what that is? You're like, yeah, I do. Well, so there's your problem. You've decided already for all of these people what their potential is. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's as arrogant as it gets. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I must know you so well to know what you're capable of. And yet, how, how much have I lived any moment in your shoes? Have I taken any time to really get to know you? And even if I had, would it ever be enough? Could I know you so in and out to, to understand what you're capable of? And yet, I've already made that decision because I say, oh, I've seen you do this a bit and therefore taking that into account, I have a story that says you can probably achieve that. But what if you looked at that person and all you could see is pure possibility, no roof on what they could be. So when you speak to them, that's what they feel. Mm -hmm. But honestly, when you speak to them, and not only that, but when you speak to them about something that you'd like them to do or that a job you have for them in the team, that you have absolute trust that they will do it whilst you're telling them as opposed to the feeling that we often have, which is like, you're probably going to mess this up. So I'm going to talk to you like you're going to mess it up. Yeah, don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Yeah, you're going up. to be fine, honestly. <laughs> well, so even things like, 
understanding, do you know what the, the best is of someone? Well, no, I don't. Well, how can you get it out of them? Mm. As soon as you take direction, you're going to ruin it. So what is the only direction you can take? Like you just said, well, look after your own. Mm. Now, that will, teach, that will give you everything you need to know about how to talk to them, because talk to them like you talk to yourself. But that's what they mostly do. Most people go to, right, I need you to do something for me, or I need you to do a role which I think is important, so I'm going to go straight down fear and anger. I'm going to get you a bit fearful mm -hmm. and a bit angry about it, because I, without those two, I don't trust you'll do it. Because that's how we talk to ourselves. Yeah. I've got to go and do that. If I don't do it, this will happen, so I better go and do it. I can't believe you just did that right, so I'm going to get it. Yeah. Like, but, but why? when you can become the ultimate teammate to yourself, it's the same thing. When you can do that, you'll find that that creates the team. But to be the ultimate teammate to yourself, you've got to give up this idea that you've got any truth about what you're capable of. Mm. To have some kind of story about who you are that you think is, has any truth to it. But to use that story... As an inspiration, I had a guy that was an inspiration to me, a guy called Steve Black. As he walked alongside me and spoke to me, he genuinely believed I was capable of anything. Wow. Genuine. And as he was talking, it was fascinating. He couldn't help it. Mm. Almost to the point, if you look at me, he, I spoke to him not long ago, he passed away recently, but I spoke to him not long ago. And I was, I was, I think, 40 years old. I'd been retired for five years. And on the call, he's talking to me like I could play again. Like I'm going to play again. Not just that, but he's talking to me like I'm going to play again and I'll destroy everything mm. in the game. And part of me is thinking, if I had you right next to me, I could do that. I know I could. So, so what was it, though, that you felt from him that made you feel that way? It was pure. Mm. But did you feel the pressure of him believing that? No. It, it was mm. pure because the pureness of it meant that it didn't matter. It was unconditional. It wasn't on a level of, well, I believe this until this happens and I won't. It was, yeah. this is my truth. It is a truth that cannot be broken. And it was phenomenal. But the, like I said, in terms of the, 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 um, team, the team spirit side of things is, I think ultimately it's about gathering energy. And that's all, everything you do brings you energy. And that's what we were talking about before, about you looking after yourself, doing what feels good, finding ways to, finding your, your highest excitement in every moment. So you're in, you're in a team meeting. The coach is doing a video of the game and he's just about to bring up something you did in the game, which went terribly. <laughs> and you're looking thinking, okay, so how do I follow my highest excitement now? I have to find out what's my highest excitement. My highest excitement is to look at this and be like, I want to learn from this. Okay, or it might just be, I want to relax. Mm -hmm. That's my highest excitement now is relaxing. But follow it. It's got a message. When every little player is, every player is following their highest excitement in every moment, the sum total builds up and you always get something that you just can't attribute to the players. It's too much. Yeah. You've got 30 players and you've got something happening which is like a thousand players. You cannot work out how it happens. All you do is look after your bit. Highest excitement, do things that bring you energy. Um, and even when it feels tough, find a way of something that brings you energy. And relaxation is always that. Mm. Relax, find energy, and then a passion will come up, whether it's to speak to someone, whether it's to do this, and you follow those. And geez, that wheel we were talking about earlier that you feed with a team, teams just can't, they don't know how to lose. Mm. You also get others who don't know how to win. Right. And it, that's what teams is in your environment. Help other people to follow their highest excitements by following your own. Yeah. And, and speak through those excitements. Get into that amazing space before you speak to someone. When you're not in that amazing space, stop before yeah. you go and speak to someone. Relax. Bring yourself to at least calm. You don't have to be feeling great, but at least calm before you go and speak to another human being because your words may have a big effect. If they're going to have a big effect, would you rather it's yeah, coming from a place that might open them up to something amazing in their lives or yeah, bring them down to where you are? I think that message is, is so amazing. Like... It really hits me how the responsibility that we have for each other. There's a documentary, I'm not sure if you've seen it on Netflix, called Stats. Have you heard of this? So I've got a lot of things to go and watch and read after I know, this. I know. Uh, you're yeah. probably going to be like, they're all rubbish. <laughs> um, it's Jonah Hill talking to his therapist. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard and they're of this, interviewing. Yeah. yeah. And there's a moment in it where he says, um, it's really interesting. You go to your therapist for advice and for them to help you. And they'll listen. And they might ask you some questions. 
but they won't tell you what to do. And then you go to your friends <laughs> who are idiots and they'll tell you exactly what to do. Yeah. And he's like, this is not right. Yeah. Um, but yeah. obviously it's something that I think we're kind of supporting is the whole talking and getting people to um, understand the privilege of having these conversations and the roles that can have with other people. How do you see us authentically being able to do that collectively? I think it comes back to the coaching point that with the care and love that you have for other people and the desire for them to feel better, you can start to overreach and take charge of what they should be feeling and how they should get there. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you take over that, unless you're in a space of absolute enlightenment, it's a dangerous role to go. And you do mm -hmm. see a lot of the enlightened yogis or whatever, giving you sort of maybe sort of slightly more detailed paths, but you're yeah. kind of like, okay, now when you look at someone before you're about to take ultimate advice, you get a good picture of their kind of life and is it something you really want? But yeah. for me, we're all flawed. And part of that flaw is the fact that we want so badly people to feel good, want to take away all their suffering. But actually, you take away that, you take away all growth. Mm -hmm. You take away all conscious ownership of that growth as well. And I think the fact is, is, is when you suddenly say, well, hold on, if I don't know, I know what I want for you, but if I don't know how or exactly what it should look like, right, well, leave those aside. Now, how do I react and how do I, sorry, interact with you? Mm. It's like, well, I can't go to what you should go do because I don't know. I can't go to how things should be because I don't know. So I'm left with just you here and now. And then you're like, well, maybe that's exactly what I'm supposed to mm -hmm. transmit is the fact that I'm also here and now being like, let's just be here with it. Mm -hmm. And you talk as much as you need to, and I'll be here with it. But what sometimes interrupts that is you're thinking, someone says something, you say, ah, mm -hmm. yeah, well, maybe do this. Because it's like, but hold on. Just let them, and suddenly I think something comes in that space, which doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from your old ideas. It comes when you're sort of like, I don't, and people have always had this. You say, I don't know why I need to say this, but I just feel mm, like mm. this. And it's always right. right. But what's not always right is the old idea saying, this is how things should play out. This is, and that's sometimes that thing with helping people is you can only sort of dangle a, a, a sort of rope from where you are. Yeah. So when they climb out, they get to where you are. Yeah. And you're kind of like, Right. No, I'm not. <laughs> and also now they're living, or well, they might be living where you are, but they're not even you. Even yeah. less relevant for them. Okay, yeah. But maybe to sort of say, come join me on the rope that is dangling from, I don't know, but I'm just mm. going to keep climbing. You're like, brilliant. But when you think, oh, no, it's me, I'll, I'll get you out of this. Yeah. You're sort of like, well, that just ends up in more problems somewhere else. But actually to say, come join me. Yeah. And but to be humble enough to say, I I don't know also, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know who I am, I don't know where I'm going, but but I'll be there with you. And yeah. this is to tell a quick uh, story is what we had with the rugby is the thing that bonds you closest in the changing room is that you have that immense unknown. And within that unknown you have such desires for how it should be, but you don't know. And you want to know. But you can't, and it's so vulnerable, and it's so difficult. But you stand there in the huddle with the guys one minute before going out, and the thing that bonds you closest is not that someone comes over to you and says, "Don't worry, it'll be fine," it doesn't do anything. It's the fact that someone looks at you and says, "I'm there as well. Mm. I'm, I'm feeling it." Mm -hmm. But I will go there with you, and I will be there the whole time next to you, doing everything I can. And you say, "I'll do the same for you," and it's that's the bond. Wow. The bond is not. Don't worry, I'll sort this out. And I tried to be that guy. Really? I tried to be the guy that was like, don't worry, I've done 45 hours of practice. Yeah. <laughs> just yesterday. <laughs> In order that I'll make everything perfect. Yeah. It was uninspiring. All right. it did was kind of make people sit back and go, well, you go do it. Yeah. In which case I was going, but I don't want to be doing it. Yeah. And you mentioned about the man of the match thing was that when I came out, other players went in who were a bit more like, all right, well, come on, guys, I'll go with you. Yeah. And the guys went, nice, okay. came forward, oh, wow. all played together. And of course, suddenly this player's like, oh, because I was holding people back mm. with this idea of, like, I'll sort it, I'll be the savior, I'll be this. So in a way, it's that powerful bond that's created, not by being something, by offering the answer, 
by you know taking the photo that says look at me living the best life it's more like you said at the very start of this interview it's more that power to sit there and say i don't know mm. and you're oh wow but you've had this happen and it's like yeah i've got challenges coming all the time yeah. only a year year and a half ago whatever i was in the right thick of it with all this that has come to me and yet mm. i'm still there mm. suffering and it's like but i sat in that suffering and was like i want this I want to find out what this is about compared to the only difference was it hurt just as much. But the last time before that, it was like, I can't bear this. This time it was like, I can't bear this, but, but I'm slightly excited by it. Really? Slightly, yeah. And now, it, now when it goes, you miss it. It seems wow. horrible to say it in my space because within it, there's such guidance. Mm. Within your challenges, there's such guidance that when you start hitting that, everything's pretty good. It's like the energy is tapering off. Right. Um, and it's a very interesting space, but it's always that part of just saying that there is no one out there living the best life. Mm, no. But there's people out there who are still excited about what's what's being revealed by this. Mm. And I think that's the the power that was in the changing room with us was like, look, none of us have got the answer, no matter how much we're all trying to look the part. Yeah. And it's like, we're all in the same space. And when you deeply admit that to each other, you go, this bond will last us a lifetime. It, it, there's so much power in that. And you've touched on a few things there about that acceptance. I think I've heard you talk about being in the tunnel and looking to the opponent both being like, yeah. And yeah, the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is horrible. Yeah, and you get a bond from that because then you end up playing <laughs> yeah. with them at the end of your career in the same team. You look at each other being like, all right. Yeah, yeah that was rough. Yeah. But with that, we kind of were discussing earlier about that culture at that time in the sort of early 2000s. A, was there an, a space to allow you to think and be that way? So was there space for you to have a conversation with someone and not feel like you have to give them the answers or not pretend like you've, you're confident and everything's covered? And in your role now at Coaching with England, do you now see that space developing and evolving? The, in the best teams, the environment is put in place to give people the freedom to be themselves. Much the same as me as a captain, I struggled for a long time because people felt around me, I think, that they had to be the way I needed them to be around me. They couldn't be who they were. There wasn't enough space. I was too rigid and black and white in how I saw things. Um, and when you have an environment which allows people to know what they're after, to have structure and, and guidance and direction in terms of like what we're going to do out there, but still have all that space and that they can be themselves, do it their way and feel that it's always about them, even though it's also got some direction to it. It's always about them. And when teams put that in place, you don't have so many of those conversations needed, funnily enough. Yeah. But when, when it's not in place, it triggers a lot of the distrust issues that we all have, especially in, in certain areas or whatever. Um, and when you're in that space, and that obviously does happen in any space, people always struggle in all kinds of ways, whether it's the most amazing workplace or not, it's never going to be perfect for everyone. And, and, but anyway, people are going to have that problem. But that's where the future of all of this is going. It's where the future, I think, of the world is going, is in that people recognizing that we put a lot around the physical, a lot of physios, a lot of doctors in squads, you know, now they're more and more and more to look after every player straight after training, let's get them doing this. The mentor is an untapped resource and you have psychologists and what have you, but you know, the psychologist is very interesting in that space. You can connect with one and actually what works for some person, you go and talk and you're just like, I just don't feel it. Mm -hmm. So you know you need lots of them. So now do you have a system where you have everyone has an opportunity there to to be able to unload and talk and and explore? Undoubtedly it's where the future of the game has to go when people realise that. There's only so far you can push a bar on how much energy, how big a player can get, mm -hmm. how fast they can be. You're like, we're talking about these. Yeah. But the mental side, it's like, wow, you get a player that feels phenomenal about themselves. You look at the difference one week to the next. Mm. So that's the area that's going to unfold into, definitely. But putting those, that requires, I think, relationships of enormous trust. And when you have, you're going to select me or not, it's quite difficult to have that, not to be like, oh, what does he want me to do? Or what does she want me to say? And I'll say it because I want to be selected versus, you know, and that requires people in all those leadership roles to, to just recognize the importance of, and the value of every individual, not just in the team, but in the, in the hotel you're staying in or in the, 
you know, in the ground staff that have prepared the pitch immaculately, whatever it is. Um, and I think it's moving in every area of sport, but it's going to keep moving as people realize that um, part of the issue that maybe is there is that performance is sometimes driven, often driven through fear, anger, um, and those kind of energies, which ultimately are destructive. No matter how much they might work for a short term, they break people down. Um, and they also pull on the, the most difficult parts of people. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of almost, you come into the, into the situation this big and you leave it this big. Mm. It's kind of, well, hold on, should, if we're an organization that's really gonna make a change in the world, should we be bring, bringing people in that feel this big and they leave this big? Yeah. And, and how do you do that? You've got to explore. Yeah. But most of it's about controlling. And I think that's changing now. People are realizing that we want the right result, but the right result comes from performance. And performance comes from exploring, you know, reaching into what you're really capable of, being inspired. Okay, so we have to give up this idea that we can control the result. How can we control the performance? Well, you just said it before, you work on yourself. That's it. I mean, when I speak to you, I think everyone here is getting that feeling of excitement about genuinely anything is possible. And I literally could talk to you all day, but I probably <laughs> shouldn't do that. So the last couple of questions, yeah, sorry, if that's away. okay. Um, think that all of the things that you're touching on there about allowing people to perform and sort of creating that space and that feeling. You've been part of some genuinely like iconic moments. And it seems that in those moments, you've always stepped up and delivered. Have you been able to kind of identify or ever realized what it is in you that has allowed you to do that? Um, yeah, do you know what, interesting. I, I always half question myself whether I should do this, but to just verify, I love the fact you said that at the beginning, that I've always stepped up. I could give you so many examples of yeah. when I've stepped up and it hasn't worked. Okay. People just don't remember them. Um, was it Wayne Gretzky who says that? Yeah, probably. He says something like... Michael Jordan said it about more misses than yeah. he hit. But it's so true. There are so many that I stepped up to and it didn't work out. Right. People just remember the other ones, mm. which is cool. But yeah. I remember both. <laughs> so what about if the question <laughs> so, was... But, but however, I'll still, I'll, yeah, exactly. I'll still, I'll still answer the question because... Yeah, one of the things we've mentioned that's, that's we're not mentioned here, which is really powerful and a big player in this, is your kind of your energy, your desire, and your mission, if you like, your purpose. Now, like I mentioned at the very beginning of this, that I, as a child, I had that. I had the fear as well, and I think I had the fear as well because I felt like I had something that needed to be done. I knew it. I had something that needed to be done. And I went for it. I couldn't stop myself. There was no sort of, oh, you're so dedicated. It's like, I can't not do this. Mm. It's harder for me to sit down and relax than it is to be out there for two hours doing this or this. I just, yeah. I just knew I had something. And through my childhood state, it came out in this kind of like, it has to be rugby. It has to be winning things. It has to be. And that obviously that's driven by the fear or driving the fear, whatever it is, but it has to be. Well, I've then got to be the kicker. Mm -hmm. The only individual, sort of, right, apart from throwing in a line out, really, and a few other little things, it's like the one bit where the game stops and it's on you. It's like, what's well, got to be me? Right. Why? You're someone that fears failure. Is that really a good idea? <laughs> it's like, it has to be me. Wow. And then as games go on, I get injured. And everyone sort of said, oh, you've got so many years of injury. How did you come back? It's like, I had no choice. Mm. After I had my neck operation, the next day I'm in the gym riding a bike with a neck brace on. My brother's like, what are you doing? So I don't know, I, it, I can't not. Mm. The difficult part is when people are in places and you feel like, how do we get them going? You're like, that's an interesting question, a much bigger one, a very difficult one mm. to address and how you inspire and you find the right touch points of people and you offer the incentives that, you know, and, and you find ways of bringing everyone together. But for me, I just knew I had to be doing that. And then at some point towards the end, when the rugby came, it was like, it's not there anymore quite as much. And it was like, right, I'm not gonna play rugby anymore. And with a bit of time and patience, that same drive starts to come through somewhere else. And it's like, ah, oh, it was never about the rugby. Mm. And whatever I'm into now, which is this, it's kind of, 
it's probably more likely to be about this. And as I continue to get out of the way, it's like, ah, oh, it's more, and I'm going to enjoy finding out what it is. But I've known since I was, I've had an energy in me that can't rest. Wow. And part of me, this is where I disconnect from people sometimes because they're sort of like, well, it's not been my experience of life. And a lot of some of the things I talk about with the relaxation and what have you has been driven by an insatiable kind of purpose. I haven't always known exactly what it is after the rugby, but it's re re revealing itself. And I, I love following it. I can't rest. You know, I sit there and think, I just have a few days chilling out. It's like, mm. I'm just onto something. Yeah. And I, and I love looking at myself and being like, what is it you're into? How's this shaping up? So it's a nice space, but it's difficult because the other part of that is, you know, how do you, when people don't have that and they're asking, you know, how do you find your passion? Like, we all have it. And I think it's having compassion for yourself, patience, time, relaxation, acceptance, awareness, all those things that reveals the passion that's in the compassion, if you know what I mean. It's, it's amazing to hear you speak about that. And when you find that thing and follow it and drive it, the momentum that builds, it's such an exciting place to be. Um, Johnny, I, I have to wrap up with a final question. And we like to ask this question to all of our guests. <laughs> and it's far too big. It's right, a terrible okay. question. It's a big question. Pretty it? sure it's awful, right. but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. Um, so obviously at Vitality, we are, you've kind of spoken about some of the things about supporting people with habit changing, building these small things that will over time accumulate and develop into much bigger things. And I think, you know, you touched on motivation and we like to incentivize and reward people for doing those things. So my question to you is, is there one change that you can identify that you've made that's had the biggest impact on you? Yeah, I think undoubtedly in the more larger scale, it's been about this whole, the desire to take a bit more responsibility for what's happening within me. And it's all tied in with the awareness, acceptance and responsibility. But probably the biggest thing has been the awareness and acceptance part to just be aware that when you kick into that under, you can see it slightly irrational according to the situation. You know, you're having a chat, someone says something, and you're like, oh my gosh, and mm -hmm. I'm burning. Mm -hmm. Like, this is irrational. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's hysterical, and it's sort of, uh, I quite like the expression, if it's hysterical, it's probably historical. Mm -hmm. And then to stop, and rather than jump into it, and go with it, and react, and give that gift to your future you, and say, here, there you go, you deal with that as well. <laughs> yeah to sit in the discomfort. Like I said before, I've always known what I've wanted and the discomfort of the fear has been something that I've needed to conquer. And as a result, for many years in my rugby, I burnt myself out. I went down roads of pure um, injury, mental size that was you know, on and off the field, whatever. Because within that, rising of whatever it is there's also a really powerful message mm. and it's there for you it isn't just all bad it's not oh gosh i've got the anger again it's in the anger there's a message but you can't hear it until you relax into it and sit with it and i wouldn't sit with it i wouldn't until one day i came to the point of realizing that i cannot go on anymore unless i find out what this is about and stop treating it as just a threat that i need to overcome and so you think about coping with stress instead of listen to stress mm. you think about managing pressure listen to pressure sit in it bask in it as much as uncomfortable as that feels and the urge to get up and do something and fear yeah you've got to deal with your fear of failure well no listen to it beyond the stuff where it says oh if we get this wrong this will happen it's like no listen to what it's trying to tell you underneath the message i've sort of come to every time i sit in it no matter how long it takes and when i say it, it's, it's horrible it's, there is probably, I think it's the most courageous thing anyone can do. Mm. Um, but the message that comes to it is always something deeper that says there's more of you that can come out of you. Mm. And you're just, you're denying it. There's so much here for you. You're so special. You're so welcome. You're so wanted. You so belong. And we've been trying to tell you this so many times through so many ways to try and get you to listen. Just stop, slow down, relax and take time and, and don't expect that voice to actually come up and go, oh, by the way, it's this. Mm -hmm. But it can be days. 
that's what the meditation, you know, just, just 10 minutes a night before you go to bed. But do it the same way you'd rep out in the gym. Mm -hmm. Not just because, oh, I've done my one set of bench press. Why am I not huge? It's yeah. like, well, you need to go again. Yeah. All I've eaten an avocado. Why am I not feeling <laughs> awesome? Well, you need to eat every meal. Mm -hmm. So with this, when the thing comes up, become aware of it and sit in it. Not waiting because it'll tell me now, but just sit in it because why not? Because you've tried doing the other thing and you know what that brings. But we haven't tried is this. And when you do it, it's like, ah, oh, now we're talking. I don't think there's probably a better way that we could end it. <laughs> I think that's the best sound I think I've ever got from someone. <laughs> um, but honestly, I think what we really are grateful for, though, is the way that you are sharing all of your learnings with such openness and honesty. And I think the main thing that I've got from this is the energy and the feeling that you've given everyone here today. But also, I now feel a much greater sense of comfort and happiness in just being who I am and that being completely fine and not feeling like there's mm. another way. Um, as always, it's a privilege to be able to spend this time with you, to yeah. have everyone watching be able to listen to you in this way. We really do hope it's helped so many people. And I think it's up to people to maybe find the parts that suit them. You know, we're going to have people joining in different situations, but I think there's something in there for everyone. So thanks always for this, Johnny. No, my pleasure. It's been a treat. <laughs> for everyone watching, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really do hope you've enjoyed this one. Please do join us again soon. Share this content far and wide. It's open to absolutely everyone. And we'll hope you, we, that you'll enjoy us again at another event soon.